my daughter Eliana would like to teach you a song. Would you like to learn it? All right, let's try. Okay, you you ready? You gonna teach him a song? Okay, sing along if you know it. Ready? This little light of mine, I ain't gonna let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. All around the neighborhood, ready? All around the neighborhood, I'm gonna let it shine. All around the neighborhood, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Thank you. Thank you for teaching us that song. Go to mommy, okay? Let's sing that again. All around the neighborhood, I'm gonna let it shine. All around the neighborhood, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. It's amazing as Eliana goes like this now when we sing that song. She didn't do it, she was a little shy. But isn't that the truth? The purpose, our call? Wherever we go, to let it shine for Jesus. To let it shine for Jesus. God is calling us to shine the light of Jesus in this dark world. But I know you may be thinking, how do we share Jesus in this secular, money-driven, sex-saturated, power-hungry, truth-starved culture? How in the world do we share and shine the light of Christ in this dark culture? And this is what I hope by God's grace to answer in this morning's teaching. Let's pray. Father, we're here, you are calling us to shine our lights for you, to shine light in this place of darkness. How do we do that? How do we do that in today's culture? Teach us, O oh Lord. Help us to learn principles from your word and through your servant, Paul. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. I invite you to turn with me to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, the apostle Paul, a man whom God called and used to reach thousands upon thousands of people. He called him to share Christ, and he comes to this country by the name of Greece. You've heard of Greece before. In fact, look what the Bible says in verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within, within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Now. What was Athens? I, I've been there, I was there 12 years ago in 2006. I finished my last class in my undergrad for my undergraduate degree in Greece. I don't mean to make you jealous or covet, but my classroom, I learned biblical Greek uh, in a classroom that was on top of a hotel that looked over the Aegean Sea. So I had a hard time concentrating and so did my other, my other uh, classmates. But Athens was a beautiful, is a beautiful place, a beautiful city. During the time of Paul, it was a famous city. Cicero said Athens singularly upheld the reputation of Greece. It was a learned city. It was the intellectual center of the world. And so Paul roams the city of Athens. He looks around and he is disgusted. Paul is repulsed by the plethora of idols. But this did not stop Paul from witnessing about Christ. I mean, sometimes we throw in the towel, we try to witness to people, we try to invite people, we, we, we see all the darkness in our world. And they're new, and on the news, we see this. And sometimes we're like, oh, let, me, let me just give up. Paul didn't give up. Paul kept going. In fact, I believe that the darker the room, the brighter a light will shine. It's an opportunity for us to shine the light of Christ. And so let's pick it up now in verse 17. Follow with me in your Bibles. And I just put the reference on the screen. You can go back one slide, Dominic. 
Follow follow along in your Bibles, and I'm going to read through this. Verse 17, therefore, Paul, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers, and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. This was Paul's strategy. When he would come to a new place, a new town, he would first go to the Jewish synagogue. He would find the believers, and then he would reason with them, and he would try to rally them, and then he would go to the, to the marketplaces. He would go to the, the roads, and he would find people, and he would share Christ. This was his pattern. Verse 18. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. We can stay on that slide. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Verse 19. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? So you can imagine these philosophers are like, what in the world is this guy talking about? Verse, verse 20, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. Verse 21, for all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. So here's Paul witnessing in an idled culture. Now, that's the title of this morning's presentation, this teaching. Witnessing in an idled culture. That's not even grammatically correct. Idled is a noun. I'm using it as an adjective. I made it up, but it, you get the point. How in the world do we witness in a culture full of idols? How do we witness in this world that is relativistic? Do you know what I mean by that? How do we witness in a world that says your truth is your truth? and my truth is in my truth, so don't try to impose your truth on me. How do we do that? How do we witness in a world that is pluralistic? What do I mean by that? There are dozens, hundreds of different worldviews and different beliefs out there. How in the world do we witness and share of Christ in a pluralistic society? Well, we get a clue of how to do this from the Apostle Paul. Here are three steps. Three steps to witnessing in an idol culture. Let's learn Jump down to verse 22. Here we go. The Bible says this, Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus, and he said, Men of Athens, I perceive in all things that you are very religious. What was the Areopagus? It was a rocky hill about 370 feet high, not far below the Acropolis, which was in an ancient citadel located on a rocky outcrop above the city of Athens and overlooked the Agora in the city of Athens. I was there. And so you have, you have the Acropolis, this, this, major, this major structure, this major citadel, and right below that you have this Areopagus. And the Areopagus then overlooked the marketplace. And so here's Paul standing on this, this place, this, this location called the Areopagus. You know, the word was also used to refer to the council that originally met on that hill. So this hill, this Areopagus, was a place where the philosophers and the politicians of the day would talk and battle and, 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 and wrestle with ideologies and political matters. In fact, the name probably was derived from Ares, the great name for the god of war known to the Romans as Mars. So another name for the Areopagus is Mars Hill. Have you heard of that before? So here's Paul witnessing in the Areopagus on Mars Hill talking to these pagan philosophers. Let's pick it up. Verse 22 again. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. Look at verse 23. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him I proclaim to you. Do you see what Paul is doing here? Paul is affirming their desire for worship. He says in verse 22, all right, Athenians, philosophers, I saw this inscription to the unknown God, but you are people who worship because I saw a plethora of idols. He says in verse 23 that he recognizes that they had objects of worship. The Athenians worship a variety of God idols. You're talking about, I'm not talking about just a a few dozen, not a few hundred, thousands of idols. Remember in verse 16, look at the reaction of Paul when he saw the idols. Now, while Paul waited for them in Athens, 
his spirit was provoked. That word provoked also means despised or he was repulsed. Ugh. Repulsed with when he saw that the city was given over to idols. You know, according to one ancient report, there were more than 3,000 statues in the Athens of Paul's day. One of its streets was adorned with a bust of the messenger god Hermes before every house. Temples, porticos, colonnades, and courtyards were replete with, ex with exquisitively carved works of art that lavishly proclaimed the Greek love of beauty. All of this was linked with pagan worship. So here's the Apostle Paul, repulsed. But you know what? Paul doesn't give up. Paul, now catch this, please listen. Paul sees their experience of worship as a springboard to witness about God. Paul sees this experience of worship that they have, he, he, he knows that this is common ground, and he uses this common ground, you worship, as a springboard then to teach about the gospel. Now, so what is the first step to witness in our secular culture? Step number one, we'll put it on the screen, here we go. Establish that everyone worships something. In other words, recognize and establish that all people have idols. Now, Pastor Nestor, what do you mean? I mean, we don't, I don't have an idol in my house. I don't have a, a graven image, and I'm not bowing down to an idol and not feeding an idol like some people do in different cultures. What is an idol anyway? Well, look what Paul said in verse 23. He gives us a clue. He says, for I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship. So what is he saying? He's saying that an idol is an object of your worship. It could be this guitar. I worship this guitar. I, it could be that organ. I worship that organ. It could be your spouse. You worship your spouse. An idol is something that is the object of your worship. I like how Tim Keller defines an idol in his book, Counterfeit Gods. Look what he says, we'll put this on the screen. What is an idol? It is anything more important to you than God, anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God, anything you seek to give, seek to give you what only God can give. That's what he said. Now, we'll stay on this slide. Let me, list, let me continue to read what he says. He gives some examples of this, please listen. A counterfeit God is anything so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would feel hardly worth living. An idol has such a controlling position in your heart that you can spend most of your passion and energy, your emotional and financial resources on, on it without a second thought. So here's some examples. He says this. An idol could be family and children, where you elevate them to the place of God and you worship your family or children. An idol could be your career or making money. An idol could be achievement or critical acclaim. An idol can be saving face or social standing. An idol could be a romantic, illicit, or appropriate relationship. An idol could be peer approval. Oh, I don't want to step on any toes because I want the approval of my friends and so you idolize peer approval. An idol could be competence and skill. An idol could be secure and comfortable circumstances. Ooh, let me take it easy. Yeah, God, God calls us to, to, to sacrifice for him, but let me take it easy. And you idolize easiness. Uh, uh, an idol could be your beauty or your brains. An idol could be a great political or social cause. An idol could, could be your morality and virtue, and this is a, a dangerous one for, for us as, as Christian leaders, or even success in the Christian ministry. That can become an idol. Keller continues, when your meaning in life is fixed to someone else's life, we may call it codependency, but you know, he says, but it is really idolatry. And then we'll put these words on the screen. Look what he says. He says, an idol is whatever you look at and say in your heart of hearts, if I have that, then I'll feel my life has meaning, then I'll know I have value, then I will feel significant and secure. Do you see what Paul is doing here? How is Paul defining sin to the culture? Is he saying, pagan philosophers, you're breaking the 10 commandments of God? Is he saying that? No, why? 
Why would, it be, why would it sometimes be ineffective for us to go to someone who doesn't even believe in God and say, hey, you're a sinner because you break the Ten Commandments? That person, that skeptic who's not even a Christian might say, well, that's your moral code and I have my own moral code. However, Paul doesn't start on sin is breaking the commandments. Paul starts on sin is idolatry. He levels the playing ground. We're all worshipers of something. We all have idols. Now you might be asking, all right, Pastor Nestor, this sounds fine and dandy, but how do I know what my idols are? And so here's my question for you. To discover your idols, ask yourself this question, and we'll put it on the screen, and I'm gonna give you a few moments for this, for this to sink in. What do I naturally turn to during my leisure time? What do I naturally turn to when I have free time? Think about that for just a few moments. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? All right, you filled in that blank. Here's my humble suggestion. If God is not in the picture, there's a very good chance that that is your idol. An idol is whatever you look at and say in your heart of hearts, if I have that, then I'll feel my life has meaning, then I'll know I have value, then I'll feel significant and secure. Oh, come on, friends. You know the idol in your closet that no one knows? I know mine. Why do, we even keep, why do we keep going back to these idols anyway? Why do we do this? Because we think that they will really satisfy our deepest longings. You know, the reality is that our idols, they leave us empty and devastated. Same author, Tim Keller, in his book, Center Church, he says this, in general, idols can be, a good, can be good things that we turn to in, into ultimate things to give us significance. And then he says this, put up the words on the screen here. A sure sign of the presence of idolatry is inordinate anxiety, anger, or discouragement when our idols are thwarted. So if we lose a good thing, it makes us sad, but if we lose an idol, it devastates us. Do you understand the difference between the two? Let me give you a few examples. Let's say you love your spouse. You love your spouse but you love God supremely. If your spouse were to leave, or he, your spouse were to die, God forbid, you would be sad, but because you worship God, you're not devastated. Does that make sense? However, if your spouse becomes the main object of your worship, if you lose your spouse, what happens? Not only are you sad, you are devastated and you are crushed. This is what happens with idols. It leaves us devastated. Let me give you another, exa another example. If achievement is my idol and I never rise to the top and I never produce and I never climb the, the ladder in my work, then life is not worth living. If I idolize my child and my child dies, then my life is a wreck. If money is my idol, now money is not evil in and of itself, but if I have money and I supremely love God, if I were to lose money, I just, my life, I might be sad, but I'm still going to trust in this God. I, my life is not completely shattered. However, if money is my idol and I lose it overnight, then my purpose for living is vanished. If my moral performance is my idol, and I fail to live up to my standards, then I will perpetually feel like an utter failure. And friends, this is so dangerous because there are many people who sit in churches all throughout North America and around this world who, they, yeah, they say they love God, but the reason they love God, they don't serve Him as an end in Himself. They serve Him as a means to the end of their moral perfection. But if your moral perfection, your moral perfection is an idol and you keep failing over and over and over again, your life will be perpetually devastated. What's the point? Your idol, my idol, leave us empty and devastated. So how do we witness in an idol culture? Step number one, we'll put it on the screen. Establish that everyone worships something. Step number two, teach about a creative and relational God. Look in verse 24, Acts chapter 17, verse 24. God who made the world and everything in it, what is what he's saying? God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands 
as though he needed anything since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. Verse 26. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. What is he saying here? Paul teaches that God created and that he sustains this world, that he is completely sovereign over this world. And he also teaches these pagan philosophers during their time that they were created by God, that God created mankind. So what's the first teaching that you would teach when you're teaching about a creative and relational God? We'll put it on the screen. Teach that God created you. Paul wholeheartedly believed this and he established this Old Testament reality based on Genesis chapter one and two. This was the foundational reality to all reality. He knows that God as the creator is the foundation for all reality. Now friends, you might be thinking to yourself, why in the world does this matter? Here's my humble answer. Because if you have a faulty foundation, your whole life will crumble. Allow me to explain. Everyone in this sanctuary, all the neighbors on your street and all your coworkers, everyone in this world has what we call a worldview. What is a worldview? We'll put the words on the screen here. A worldview is how someone views or interprets reality. It's kind of like the lens by which someone's, someone defines and views this world. It is a framework through which or by which one makes sense of the data of life. Now follow here, follow my reasoning here. Put your thinking caps on, put your seat belts on because we're gonna go through this. Look at this. Every worldview is comprised of four components. We'll put this on the screen. Number one, origin. Where did I come from? Two, what is my purpose in life? Three, what is the basis for my morality? And number four, where am I going? Number one, origin. Two, meaning. Three, morality. Four, destiny. Now, who is Paul talking to? Paul is talking to two main audiences. Did you find out? Look at verse 18. The Bible says this. Here's Paul. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. So here are the Epicureans and Stoics there and Mars Hill talking to Paul. He knows this. He's talking to the Stoics. The Stoics were these people who believed, who had this belief in pantheism, this idea that, that God and the universe are one and we're all trying to be a manifestation of the divine. But they also had this performance-driven uh, worldview. That's them. But let's pick on the Epicureans. Who were the Epicureans? The Epicureans were followers of Epicurus and were indifferent to gods, viewing them as too removed to be objects of concern. In fact, they were kind of like, what would we call them? They would be called agnostic secularists, all right? In other words, they didn't even care about this, the gods. They didn't even care about God. So this would be equivalent to our modern day agnostics or atheists. Do you have anyone, do you know anyone in your circles who's an agnostic or an atheist? Okay, what is an agnostic? Well, first of all, what's an atheist? An atheist is someone who says, no, there is no God. An agnostic is really soft atheism, which is, yeah, I mean, there could be a God, but I really don't know. So these Epicureans were people who were kind of like atheists. Now let's examine that worldview. Let's look at atheism. Next slide. What, so Epicureans were agnostics and atheists. Next slide, here we go. For atheism, their worldview, what is, the, what is origin? Their origin is we are a random project, product of natural selection. You know, there's macroevolution, and, and the, there was this bang, and then this primordial soup, which turned into this form, which turned into a monkey, and here we are. And all that happened was the strongest survived, the, 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 the stronger defeated the weak, and so we are here just by random chance. Secondly, meaning. There is no grand purpose. Now, they can have many purposes, like they can love their children or go on vacation or they can do well in their jobs, but there's no overarching larger purpose for their life. Th three, morality. Where is their morality grounded? It's relative, it's defined by culture. So one culture will say no, it's wrong to eat human embryos. And another culture, and this is true in Asia, I don't know which one, which country, but we eat human embryo. So which one is right? Well, it's all defined on, it's all defined on what you believe is right. And number four, what's their destiny? The destiny is annihilation, the grave. And that's it, you're gone. 
What are the ramifications of this belief, my friends? The ramifications, the result is this, that life is ultimately meaningless. Now, come on, Pastor Nestor, don't you know? We can have meaning, atheists can have meaning, but can, 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 they, can, it, can it ultimately have meaning? Can life ultimately have meaning in this framework? My answer to that is no. If you believe that you are just a random product of chance, then life is ultimately meaningless. Now, there's a book, I recommend you get it. It's called Making Sense of God by Tim Keller. And he quotes Thomas Nagel in his book, What Does It All Mean? He says this, even if you produce a great work of literature which continues to be read thousands of years from now, eventually the solar system will cool or the universe will wind down and collapse and all trace of your effort will vanish. Look at the words, we'll put the words on the screen here. He says this, the problem is that although there are justifications for most things big and small that we do within life, none of these explanations explain the point of your life as a whole. It wouldn't matter, it wouldn't matter if you had never existed and after you have gone out of existence, it won't matter that you did exist. I like that, Thomas Nagel, good words. So Paul comes on the scene and he, he offers a more desirable wor world view to these people. In contrast to this Epicurean atheism, he offers Christianity. And what does Christianity have to offer? Here we go, put it on the screen. Number one, what's our origin? We are created by an eternal God. What about meaning in life? Our meaning in life is to love and serve God and man. Where do we derive our morality? From God's commands and his commandments. Number four, what is our destiny? It's not the grave alone. It's eternal life in heaven with God. And what are the ramifications of that worldview? What is the result? That life has ultimate meaning. Friends, if you believe that you are created by God, come on, just think about this for a minute. If you and I, if we're created, if we are created by God, then we are made in his image. And if we are made in his image, then you have innate beauty and worth. I love what Pastor Michael Getz shared in this uh, Witnessing 101 event that we're having. We got about 70 people there in that south side of the fellowship hall. Come in the afternoon, the program's here. But he pointed out this line that, that, that stuck with me. I said, I have to use it in the sermon. Quoting from Christian Service, page 121. Just six words. Actually, one sentence. Ellen White. One soul is of infinite value. For Calvary speaks its worth. One soul is of infinite value, not only because of Calvary, but because when God fashioned you and created you, he talked to Jesus and he talked to the Holy Spirit and he said, hey, Deuteronomy, let us make man in our image. Do you realize that you resemble God? You have characteristics of God. He made you in your image, therefore, you have beauty, you have worth, because God is infinitely beautiful and he's infinite, infinitely worthy. Also, if you believe that you were created by an eternal God, you will have this hope of living with him forever. I remember um, in the city of Chicago, my friend was a good friend with, with someone who went to the same high school that I did. And um, this, this young man lost his grandma. In fact, his mother was an avowed atheist and after her mom died she was completely devastated because what you see is what you get you're here in life you're here on this earth and then you're gone friends is there any hope in that ultimately is there any hope i have conducted or have been a part of i mean dozens and dozens of funeral services and in every single one, there is always a word of hope that we can see our loved ones again. The Christian worldview, our, the Christian worldview gives us the most hope. Paul knows this. Friends, do you see how knowing that God created you makes a world of difference? It does. Teaching number one, God created you. Created you. Teaching number two, we're going to put it on the screen. Number one, God created you. Keep going. Number two, God created you for relationship. All right, we're getting kind of heady when we're gonna land this plane 
And I promise you, we're going to share with you a story that will compel you. Paul moves from this intellectual descent. He's dealing with all these philosophers. And you know what he does, what he does in verse 27? He moves, he moves then to a relational dimension. He says this in Acts 17, verse 27. So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him. That means that the hope that they would touch him and see him. Okay, that's what he's saying. And actually find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Paul is going from this intellectual realm of ideas, this theory, and he's taking truth and he's making it personal. He is, he, he is displaying a God who longs for relationship. Ah, oh, you Epicureans and your Stoics, your gods are so far removed. But there was a God who came in the form of Jesus Christ who wants a relational connection with you. That's what, exactly what he's telling these people. This type of relational God was foreign to these people. They had no idea what this was like. Come on, seriously? I'm going to be, have a personal relationship with the God of Nike or the God of, of Ares? No way. Friends, the God who created you is not aloof. He's not sitting some, uh, you know, up in this high tower, totally disconnected from your experience. This God wants to be in close, close relationship with you. Truth is not just an idea. Truth has a relational quality. Truth is not just a proposition. It's not just an idea. It is primarily a person. And this is exactly what, what Paul was teaching. This reality was completely foreign to the Greek philosophers. They spent their time speculating and battling and weighing ideas. And friends, while ideas excite our minds, they will never satisfy the deepest longings of the human heart. In fact, Jesus said this, John 17, verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So you might be asking, how does a relationship with God, this relational God, really make a difference? Well, I offer you at least two things. One, I promise you, you'll have more peace in life. You'll have more peace in life when you realize that the goal of life is not to perform or to do better, but to be in relationship with God. Early in my Christian experience, I fell into that trap. Performance, I used God to help me perform better. And every time I broke that code, I, I, my life was crushed. But as I learned about God's grace and this relational quality that God wants with me, then no longer did I focus on the rules or the results, but I focused on the relationship. And guess what? That relationship with God helps me to follow his rules. It helps me get the result, the spiritual results I want. Let me give you an example. Yesterday, instead of as I did maybe over a decade ago, just beat myself up when I'd break a commandment, man, I enjoyed, I enjoyed my time with God, like communing with him, having a relationship with him. So I started by... Uh, reading, I'm reading th through the Bible in a year, and meditating over these verses. As I was driving in my van, I pulled out my Kindle. I didn't read a lot, I just meditated on maybe one or two verses. And I said, yeah, God, that's amazing. And I just enjoyed communing with God, enjoying this relationship with Him throughout the day. Have you ever done that? And then as I was driving uh, from King Supers, I'm praying for the, 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 the Holy Spirit. Lord, I need your Holy Spirit. And I'm sensing and I'm, walk, I'm sensing God and I'm walking with him and I'm talking with him and I have this real relationship with him. And at nighttime, I get on my knees and I, and I spend some time praying for you, for my friends, for people. I say, God bless people. And, and throughout the day, I'm not just following a God of rules. I'm, I'm actually having this real talking relationship with the Father. And I guarantee you, that relationship with God will give you a peace that passes all understanding. You can have that today. And not only that, you will be able to really love and care for people. Jesus said that, what are the two greatest commandments? What did he say? Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. When I experience God's unconditional love, that he loves me no matter how much I fail. Did you know that he loves you more? He loves you more than you'll ever know, and even if you stumble and fall, he still loves you? When I experience a God like that, when I experience a God who loves me no matter how much I fail, I will begin to offer unconditional love to those who wrong me. Friends, this really works. Usually when someone offends us, what happens? Dude, I can't believe that person crossed me. Man, like, seriously, that person just cussed me out. 
When someone offends us, we despise the offender. However, when I know that God loves me, even when I've offended him and I have this relationship with him, I begin to offer the same grace and love to the offender anyway. It makes a difference. Step number one in witnessing to an idled culture, we'll put it on the screen, establish that everyone worships something. Step number two, teach about a creative and relational God that God created you to, that God created you for relationship. And last but not least, step number three, call to surrender. Look what Paul does in verse 30, Acts 17, verse 30. The Bible says this. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to what? To repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. He used the R word to a bunch of secular people, pagans. Repent. He calls them to repent. Why? Paul says here in verse 30 and 31 that God has winked at their ignorance. All right, Athenians, you worship God made of hands, God's made of hands, all right. You didn't know any better. Paul says that God has winked at their ignorance of worshiping idols made by human hands, but now he is calling them to repent. Why is he saying, what, what is repentance anyway? Repentance is this, we'll put it on the screen. Repentance is a complete change of mind and a complete change of heart. It's a turning away from sin, it's a turning away from self, it's a turning away from idols. And it's, a turning, it's, and it's not just turning away from these things, but it's also turning my life over to God. That's what repentance is. I shared this story last time, a little bit of his story. But we'll put his picture on the screen. Nabil Qureshi, lived 1983, died 2017. I just finished his book, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, about this devout Muslim's journey and how he found Jesus. Friends, it's an amazing book. I couldn't put it down. I finished it. Nabil Qureshi, he was a devout Muslim. His parents were Muslim missionaries in Indonesia. But as he was going to college, he learned of Christianity from his, Dave, his friend David Wood. And you know, sometimes when we witness to people, there are times where people will be like, yeah, that's, that's good for you. And when people reject us, we, we feel rejected and we just stop being their friend. They maintained their friendship for years. And so David would talk to him about Christianity, the logical consistency of Christianity. So they had this great and honest friendship. Come on, you don't really believe that, David, do you? Yeah. Nabil, you don't really believe that, do you? I do. And they would just go back and forth, back and forth. After several years of examining the claims of Christianity himself, Nabil found himself, he found the Christian view to be logically compelling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see how the New Testament is historically reliable. I can now understand why we have a trinity. By the way, Muslims, you teach that God is, th God is one in three, that we have a God who's in three forms, that doesn't make any sense. They say that's, poly that's polytheism. You're believing in many gods. We serve one God, Allah. But he found, he, he, it made sense to him that you can have three in one. He, he studied the claims of Christianity and he found it compelling. And after that, he realized, wow, this is, this Christian teaching, this, this Jesus is real. But then this intellectual stimulation and, and uh, thoughts he was forming began to drop down to his heart. And he said, if I believe this is true, then I would have to follow it. And so he challenged God. All right, God, you have sh I've, I've, I've seen that it's logically compelling to, believe, to be a Christian. But can you speak to me supernaturally like you did a long time ago when I was a kid? And so God gave him one vision and two dreams. I want, I'll spare the details. You can read the book. One vision and two dreams that he is to follow Christ. And do you know how hard it was for him to sacrifice and to become a Christian? It's easy for us in this, in our culture, it's easy for us, but in places like in, in uh, the Middle East, where you tell your family who's pri pri who is predominantly Muslim that you're a Christian, I mean, I, you, you, you're really putting a death sentence on your, on your, on your back. One of, my, one of my professors, one of our professors in the seminary was, was persecuted by his own family when he said that he became a Christian. 
But finally, the intellectual knowledge came to bear on his heart. And I'm going to read to you his own experience. He said this, As if the living word of the Bible were in conversation with me, Jesus began responding to my heart verse by verse. Do not suppose that I have come to bring, a, bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword, for I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. But then he says this, look what he says. But how could this be? How could Jesus turn me against Ami and Abba, my mother and my father? They are such wonderful people. Why would God do such a thing? And then he says, a vulnerable moment here, Jesus answered in the next verse, anyone who loves their father or mother than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And then he says, it was not that Jesus was turning him against my parents. It was that if my family stood against God, I had to choose one or the other. God is obviously best, even if that caused me to turn against my family. But how? How could I bear the pain? He assured me that, the, that inconceivable pain and social rejection is part of the Christian walk. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not what? Is not worthy of me. Nabil says, to be a Christian means suffering real pain for the sake of God. Not as a Muslim would suffer for God because Allah so commands him by fiat, meaning by just command, but as the heartfelt expression of a grateful child whose God first suffered for him. And then he pleaded, but Lord, Lord, acknowledging my faith in you will mean the end of my life. If I don't die a physical death through emotional torment or at the hands of some misguided Muslim zealot, at least my entire life as I know it will come to an end. Nabil, my child. I felt him say, whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. And then he says this, I had to give up my life in order to receive his life. This was not some platitude or cliche. The gospel was calling me to die. Burdened by these words, I lay awake deep into that night, but far from resisting rest, sleep was ashamed to fall upon me. And friends, listen, please, listen. I had denied God long enough. On August 24, 2005, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I placed my forehead on the foot of my bed and prayed, I submit. I submit that Jesus Christ is Lord of heaven and earth. He came to this world to die for my sins, proving his lordship by rising from the dead. I am a sinner, and I need him for redemption. Christ, I accept you into my life. Step number one in witnessing to an, uh, a cult uh, an idled culture. We establish that everyone worships something. Step number two, we teach about a creative and relational God. But step number three, we call people to surrender. Nabil heard the call of Jesus. And Nabil surrendered. Take my life, Lord. Take my heart. Even if my parents mock me, even if I risk my life, Nabil said, Oh Jesus, I surrender. I repent. I turn away from my old life. And I follow the new. Why is it? I mean, isn't that a high cost? Why would God call us to surrender? You know why? I'll put it on the screen. Jesus surrendered his life for you. This is the good news, my friends. That he who knew no sin became sin for us. That our Savior, Jesus Christ, was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. This Christ, who on the cross cried the, cried the most difficult prayer that anyone could ever pray. Father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why is that? Why did he feel forsaken? Because he took the curse that you and I deserve upon himself. He who never sinned experienced what sin feels like. And he said, instead of Nestor getting the electric chair, the penalty for sin, 
Jesus comes alongside and says, Nestor, move aside. I'll take your place and I'll set you free and you can live forever. This Christ who surrendered all is a God who loved you so much, gave his life for you, and he's asking, because I surrendered all for you, would you surrender your life to me? Would you surrender your life to me? There's someone here this morning who's just compelled by the, 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 the love of Christ and his sacrifice. But this morning you're saying, Father, Jesus surrendered and I just, I'm not surrendered. And you're saying, God, would you help me surrender all to you? Would you like to make a decision to follow Jesus today? In fact, put this on the screen. If God's speaking to your heart, why don't you pull out the connect card in the pew in front of you? You can even connect, you can even write, you can even text this, this connect card number. We'll put, this, we'll put this other slide on the screen. If you are a guest here, if you're a first-time guest, you can fill out, put that as your first-time guest. But if God is speaking to you, if God is speaking to you, or you have a question about today's teaching, write that down on the connect card and put your contact information. We'll get back in touch with you. Maybe this morning you are saying, God, I want to begin a relationship with Christ. We'd love to help you alongside. We would like to come alongside you in your journey. Maybe you're so impressed by the, the, the um, call, the, by Nabil's example, and you're saying, yes, I, I want to be a Christian. And he was baptized, and, and I want to be baptized, you, baptized too. I want to surrender my life through baptism. Oh, we'd love to come alongside you in your journey. Write that on your card. Maybe you have a special prayer request. We pray for our prayer request here. Write that on the card too. We're going to give you a, a time to fill that out, you can turn it in as our deacons collect the offering, tithes and offerings. Put it in there. But could it be that God is calling you to surrender all today, to say, God, you are all to us. Would we sing this song as a, as a, as a song of praise to our God? Father, you are everything to us. Let's sing together. Precious Corner. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe you're all to us. Say that one more time, precious corner. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation. Yes. 
시와 When this passing world is over We will see you face to face And forever we will worship Jesus you been moved by Christ go make a difference in someone's life we have more life development center door hangers we want to get the word out to introduce people to Jesus oh father would let's let's pray to our father father in heaven your word says in Acts 17 verse 28 for in him we live and move and have our being as also some of your own poets have said, for we also are his offspring. Father in heaven, in Jesus, we live and move and have our being. Thank you, O oh Father. Thank you that you are everything to us. We worship you and we adore you. Send us out as your witnesses. In the name of Jesus Christ, let all of God's people say, Amen. Thank you for joining us in our worship and study today. We at Campion as ministry leaders pray that you've been encouraged in your relationship with Jesus. You're welcome anytime to meet us right here online or to slide into the service at the church. But here's an extra invitation. We want to be a blessing to you. If today you have a burden on your heart or a petition, our prayer team and pastors would be honored to join you in praying. Or if you're struggling with where God is or have a Bible question, we're here to serve. There are three ways you can reach out. We'll have these on the screen for you. You can call us, 970-667-7403, or you can text us, 970-541-9919, or you can email us, pastor at campionchurch.org. That's pastor at campionchurch.org. And until we meet again, heaven's blessings to you.